Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Morning, everybody. Hey, um, I just want to say thanks to Travis for setting the stage with this series of Holy Habits. Um, it's been so helpful. You've, you've just done so well navigating through these. These can kind of be familiar if you've been a Christian for a while. These can kind of be like you just kind of nod your head and like, yeah, I know this. But um, there is a freshness. It feels like the Spirit is on this and really... Um, growing us and maturing us through this process. So thanks, Trav, for spearheading and uh, getting us to this week. This week, we are talking about the discipline of prayer. So it shouldn't take long to talk about that. Should be able to cover everything about prayer in 30 minutes. No problem. The discipline of prayer is is interesting um, because it's the discipline that pairs with all other disciplines. So when you're practicing solitude, you're actually practicing prayer as well. You're practicing silence and prayer, fasting and prayer, self-control and a lot of prayer. This just pairs with all of these things and with all these disciplines. As we're kind of we have a whole series devoted to spiritual disciplines. It's act, they're actually not about, this is not about the disciplines themselves. The disciplines are a means to an end. And that end for us as believers is communion, closeness, and relationship with God. These are vehicles to get us to a better connection to God. So we don't want to just focus all of our energy and efforts and attention on just the practices. We want our attention to be on God, and these practices help us get there. So it is the same thing with prayer. I would venture to say that for most of us as believers, whether you're a new believer or if you are a seasoned saint and have been walking with God for decades now, prayer is something... It's like basic 101, right? You have faith, you believe, and you pray. You just spend a long time praying as Christians. But it is an area of our life, if we were honest this morning, to say it could use some work. I don't know if any of us would say, oh yeah, I've arrived. Move over, skinny man. I'll teach this lesson. I've got it. I've been to the mountain. I have it. Here it is. None of us would probably be bold enough to say, I've got this thing buttoned up. But we still are apprentices of Jesus. We're still, we're, we're still looking to him, looking to his life. We want to live like Jesus. We want to pray like Jesus. But there comes this moment in our lives when we go to pray for ourselves, we're just spending some time in prayer, or we go to pray for someone who's sick, Someone who looks like they're just down in the dumps and they kind of like make their way to you and you just kind of know, oh my gosh, they're going to ask for prayer right now. I know they're going to ask for prayer. And so you're in that moment, you're trying, you're trying to pray like Jesus. But what we often do in these kind of disciplines as we're trying to respond like Jesus would respond, act like Jesus would act, say what Jesus would say, what we do often is we fail to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus to get us to a place where we can actually engage in prayer the way that Jesus engaged in prayer. A helpful framework for this series that we've been using is training over trying. And again, for a lot of us, we've done that. We've done both of those. We've trained really hard, and we've tried really hard. We've gone to the prayer meetings. We've got the books. I mean, if you go on Amazon and just type in books on prayer, there's like 90,000 books out there. You've read like four of them, and you're doing pretty good. 
Like, we've, we've done this. We've trained and we tried, but there's still this kind of gap in between the life of Jesus, the prayer life of Jesus, and then the prayer life of Jared. They just don't always look the same. Jesus didn't just talk about prayer. He didn't just lead some good seminars on how to pray better. Your best prayers now. This is not what he did. He actually had a life that was devoted to prayer. It, it looks like for Jesus that prayer was the center that he circled his whole life around. Let's look at some of the prayer life. This is not an exhausted list here, but just starting in Luke chapter 5. But now, even more, the report about Jesus went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Jump over to chapter 6, verse 12. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. Skip over to verse 9. Now about eight days after this, he took, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James, these close friends, these disciples, and he went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white, and a voice boomed out of the sky and said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And then finally, Luke chapter 11. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Prayer seems to be the thread that weaves Jesus' whole life together. His calendar is filled with these moments. These moments of communicating with God. Looking at Jesus' prayer life, just a small little snapshot, and then looking at my prayer life, I show up to pray, and I'm going to really pray. So I've devoted 15 whole minutes to prayer. I've got a list. I've got a really extensive list of who I'm praying for and what I'm praying for, and I'm going to go for it. I am going to go, and I go, and I pour it out, and I'm fervent in prayer. And I think, man, I definitely, I've, I've slayed this. And I look at my watch, and two minutes have gone by. It's like, what else am I going to do here? Jesus prayed, and his face was altered. It, it changed. This is a little different than me trying so desperate to not unlock my phone and look at stuff on there while I'm praying. Slightly different prayer life that Jesus had and that Jared has. But today, I, I really, I believe, I've been experiencing this uh, this week in preparation. I think that, that God wants to meet us this morning and He wants to unpack and potentially um, rewire maybe some of our thinking about prayer, it can begin to feel kind of daunting. Richard Foster, who we're, we've gleaned a lot from spiritual disciplines, he has a book just about prayer, and it's like 47 chapters on 47 types of prayer that you can pray. It can feel daunting. It can feel intimidating. You can begin to feel like a second-class spiritual citizen when you start looking at your prayer life and you start looking around at other people's prayer lives, right? Martin Luther, you read this quote about him and he's like, I'm so busy, I've got to pray three hours to start my day. And it's like, what does that even mean? That doesn't even make sense to me, right? And it can feel like, whoa, how do you lift this thing? It's so heavy. And I feel like God wants to come in front of us and really help us lift this. It's actually, I don't think it's too heavy for us. I think the way that we're carrying it is making it awkward and potentially is tweaking our back and getting us bent and 
causing more pain than it needs to. So I just want to ask, maybe we just set it down and then just take a new grip on it. I'm not saying any of this stuff is going to be like new to you. You've probably, if you're a Christian, you've probably heard a lot of amazing talks on prayer. You've read a lot of amazing things. What I am asking, what I am confessing to you is that sometimes I carry this in a way that is not helpful, that it does not foster real relationship with God, and it becomes a burden, and I avoid it. And if you find yourself wrestling with that, saying, man, I, I, I'm in, I need to grow in this thing, I have not yet arrived, this is true, we're on a similar page here, just want to invite you to set it down, listen with fresh ears, and let Jesus instruct us how to pick this thing up. I believe that one of the reasons Jesus' prayer life looks different than Jared's prayer life is because I don't think Jesus viewed it just as a discipline to be mastered or a duty to be performed. It wasn't just like a right to be a Christian. Jesus was not carrying it predominantly in this way. I think the way that Jesus viewed it was mainly as a person to be spending time with. Prayer is mainly about a person to spend time with. I can classically turn my prayer times into like a big wish list that I'm reading off to Santa Claus in the sky. But at its simplest form, prayer is talking with God. You want to write that one down? That's deep. That's new, I'm sure. Prayer is talking with God. Again, nothing new, but let's just... Let's just begin to pick it back up with this idea. Prayer is talking with God. It's not talking to God. It's not talking about God. Where you sit in a circle and just kind of dialogue. It is talking with God. A conversation that goes two ways. Not a monologue of all of the emotional drama in your life that you're spewing to your counselor in the sky. He has something to say about those things. He has an opinion. He has feelings towards what you're feeling. He wants to be involved in this. Prayer is a conversation. It's talking with God. This is what Jesus teaches us as his disciples. In Luke chapter 11, they spot this life of prayer in Jesus. And they come to him and say, Lord, teach us to pray. It's the only time in Scripture that we actually see his disciples requesting how to do something from him. It's the only time we see that. Lord, teach us to... It doesn't, he, they don't come to him and say, Lord, teach us how to fast. Or, Lord, teach us how to do silence. Or, Lord, teach us how to cast out demons, which would be on maybe a top list for some of us, you know? Lord, teach us to pray. This is what they come and ask and request. They spot something. It seems like the power, it seems like the center of everything this guy does revolves around prayer. Would you teach us? Things happen when you pray. You, you feel more, you're like walking around here confidently like you're a son of God or something. Teach us how to pray like that. And so the first line of this Sermon on prayer, this workshop that he sets up for his disciples. He says, when you pray, pray like this, our Father. At this point, you know, they probably got their like notebooks out and they're like, all right, give us the layout here. Show us the system. And he starts by saying, when you pray, pray like this, our Father. Instinctively, he is saying this is a relational connection. And Jesus, he, he, we don't graduate ever from his textbook on prayer. None of us graduate away from this. We constantly come back to it because Jesus knew the heart of his disciples then and he knows the heart of his disciples now. He knows that we can so easily slip into duty and religious ritual and the perfect 
spiritual equation to get what we want. It's just so much easier when you just have to like do, you know, when you get the equation right and this plus this equals that. Show us how to get that. Show us what the equation is. And we drift straight into this ritual. We want this kind of life, so show us how to perform in this way to get to that. And Jesus knows the heart of man, the heart of woman. We just want to do it ourselves, and we want to get over that mountain. And he's saying, all right, you want to pray. Pray like this, our Father. We can even turn this, little, this, this Lord's Prayer into a ritual itself. I mean, most of us probably could recite it right now. But Jesus didn't say, this is the equation. You don't need any other prayer. Here you go. This will carry you through your life. What he said is, pray like this. He was helping rewire his disciples' minds and hearts, and that's what he's trying to do with us right now. He's trying to disciple us into a better place. And some of us today, I believe, need to repent. We need to repent. We need to turn away from this wrong thinking of God, even this wrong thinking of communicating with Him. We need to repent of treating God like a means to an end and not a person to be in relationship with. Tim, Tim Keller has this quote. He says, We may believe in God, but our deepest hopes and happiness reside in things, as in how successful we are, or in our social relationships. We therefore pray mainly when our career or finances are in trouble or when some relationship or social status is in jeopardy. When life is going smoothly and our truest heart's treasures seem safe, it does not occur to us to pray. Seldom or never do we spend sustained time adoring and praising God. We know God's there but we tend to see him as a means through which we get things that make us happy. For most of us, he has not become our happiness. God is not interested in just giving us things to make us happy. He is interested in developing a friendship and relationship that will cause deep rivers of joy. And satisfaction. He's that confident in himself. He's that confident that what we need is actually to be in communion with him. The second thing I think is a hindrance for me, and this one is, is really what I felt like God wanted to, um, again, help us in re-holding um, prayer and our prayer life. One, we have, to, we have to know this is a relational connection. So it's not a duty that we do, a ritual that we perform. But the other thing that I believe is a hindrance for me often, and maybe for you as well, is that we do end up performing in our prayers as opposing to just practicing communication with God. But Jesus is dedicated. He is dedicated dedicated to you and to me today to discipling us out of performing and into just practicing communication with the Father. Practicing the ways of slowed down, intentional, vulnerable, honest communication. And we all know that to have a good relationship, you have to have good communication. This is true across the board, not just with God. We know this is true with our relationships here and now, right here in this room. We had a marriage course that was seven weeks long here, and it was amazing. There was like over 40 couples that came, and it was seven weeks. Each night, we'd sit around tables, eat cheesecake, and talk about our feelings and all these practical things to help bolster and build our marriages. Seven weeks. We took a survey at the end of that. Asking everyone who attended, what was the most helpful night, the most helpful topic that we went through? And by a landslide, these are people who have been married 
one month to people who've been cel- that are just celebrating their 40th or 50th wedding anniversary. By a landslide, the most helpful night was on communication. This is because we know this is true in every relationship, friendships, coworkers, parent, child. All of these relationships require a, communic- a dedication to communication. Prayer, communication with God, never stops growing. And we never stop practicing that. Whether you're a new believer and you're just kind of getting your bearings on talking to this invisible God that showed himself through Jesus, you're just kind of figuring this out, or whether you're a seasoned saint and you've been engaging in conversations for years and years and years, but guess what? As life changes, we change, and as things change, we have to learn new ways to communicate. You may, you may be... Have, following God for a long time and I think today God is asking you to set it down and then just get a better grip on it because he really 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 wants communication with you he wants relationship with you this morning when we stop practicing we immediately begin to move into performing Saying what we're supposed to say, when we're supposed to say it, how we're supposed to say it. This is performing. And I do this. I drift right into it. Practicing can make you tired, but it's like a good tire. So you go to the gym, and you work out, and you go home, and you lay down, and your body is sore, and you just sweat like crazy. But it's, in a strange way, kind of a good feeling. Because you know you've trained. You know you've done something. Same thing relationally. You stay up till 2 a.m. with your spouse or your friend that you've offended, and you work through it. And it is tiring emotionally, physically. It's tiring. But at the end of it, you know that it was worth it because you're investing in that very specific and special relationship. It's worth it. Performing, on the other hand, Performing is exhausting. It will drain the life out of you. It will will suck all of the joy out of your life. And you'll get to the end of your day and you'll just wonder, what? why even bother with this? Whatever exhausts us, we just tend to avoid We go around it. We just stop paying attention to it. And if you are performing in your prayer, if you're just saying what you need to say, when you need to say it, and how you need to say it, eventually you will just stop saying it altogether. Eventually you'll just walk around it. Eventually you'll start saying things like, well, what what will be will be. God's will. I believe God wants to liberate us this morning. I believe he wants to liberate us from performance of prayer today. I believe this is true for my life. I'm first in line for this. I do not want my life to drain away out of petty performance with God. I want the real thing. I want real relationship with God. And he's inviting all of us into that today. He is actually saying, you don't have to perform. I've performed, and I can liberate you from this little play that you're involved in. So how do we start? I can feel in the room some faith stirring. I can feel it right now. I'm not the only one who's saying, like, I am so tired of showing up and just being like a parrot and saying the things that I've heard other people say and seeing no results seeing no intimacy, seeing nothing change in life. I can feel it beginning to bubble up. If you feel that right now, please begin to lean in right now. Do not just bat that away. Do not just say, well, that's for the super spiritual elite. That is for you this morning. Liberation is coming for you this morning. 
True connection with God is coming for you this morning in a new way, in a deeper way. So how do we start to do that? What's, what's, the, what's the key here? What, give us something to go on. Here's what I think is going to help in this liberation process. As this mass exodus out of performing is about to take place in this church, I believe we have to begin to pray what we've got and not what we ought. You pray what you've got. Luke 18, Jesus talks about these two men who come up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I got. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he beat his chest and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. When we come to God and we just say what we're supposed to say instead of what's really going on in here, we slip into dead religious ritual. And God does not respond to that. You don't respond to that. You know what it's like to have someone just give you lip service and say what they're supposed to say to you? Yeah, your haircut looks nice, dear. I totally believe you. That was really convincing. Say you're sorry. I'm sorry. Totally believe you. Totally convincing. We, we, we turn into like bloodhounds with insincerity. You, it's like you can sniff it out. If someone's not being sincere, you can smell it, you spot it, you hold them to it, and then you spit it out and say, try it again. I don't want anything to do with that. I know you're faking it. Let's go one more time here. God does the same thing. He can spot it, he will say it, and he'll spit it out and say, let's just try that again. Why don't you tell me what's really going on? All throughout the Bible, the people who walk closest to God prayed what they had. This is true. For the great men and women of faith, they just prayed what they had. Moses in Exodus 33, show me your glory, Lord. This is a, this is a gutsy prayer. Show, I don't want anything else right now. Just show me your glory, God. Numbers 11, same guy, same man of faith. Why have you given me these stiff-necked people? Kill me now. In one moment, he's saying, show me. I don't want anything else. Just show me your glory, Lord. In the next moment, he's saying, I hate my job. Why have you given me this job? What is it with these people? Just kill me now. Moses just prayed what he had. He was not pretending. He was not just putting on a show. Whatever it was inside of him, it was coming out towards God. He prayed what he had. Jonah, same thing. Jonah 2, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. He answered me. He came through. Jonah 4, amazing interaction. Jonah is sitting underneath this tree, and the tree dies, and God says to him, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And then Jonah says, it is, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. Jonah, leading a revival. I called out to the Lord in my distress. He came through for me. Hey, God, you killed my succulents over here. I'm really upset. He prayed what he had. David, Moses, he led the exodus. Jonah, he led the revival. David led all of us in worship. All of God's people have been being led into worship from David for centuries. He also led the people into victory and conquest and military might. Psalm 27, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. Psalm 143, 
Put an end to my enemies. Destroy all those who afflict my soul. Dash their heads against the rocks. Apparently, David desired a couple things in life. In one moment, it was to see the beauty. And in one moment, it involves some very violent things that our kids probably aren't learning about this morning. But David just prayed what he had. He did not hold back. And he was a friend of God. These people walked closest with God because they, were, they, they refused to put on a show. They refused to put on a mask and pretend with a Christian smile that everything's okay. We've got to pray what we've got and not what we ought. C.S. Lewis said, let us lay before him what is in us, not what ought to be in us. Well, what's in me is really crazy. I don't know if this is like a safe thing that you're inviting us into, Jared. I can't say what I'm thinking because it's like scattered. I can't say what I'm feeling because they're really extreme, and I don't even know if they're true. Prayer is how you deal with your thoughts and your feelings. You do not sort out all the junk that's going on in here and in here, and then you talk to God. No, you bring all the stuff that's confusing in here and all the stuff that's distressing in here and you present it to God and He helps you sort it out. The world and the church, they, they, there's this kind of direction they give. Either deny what you feel. Hey, don't say that to God. Look, He's going to smite you. You just shh, 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 shh. keep that one secret, okay? You just shove that one down. Just move on. It'll be fine. Or you just do what you feel. Hey, man, it's in your heart. Just do it. Go for it. But the Bible invites us on a third path, which is to pray what you feel. Don't deny what you feel. Don't squash it like it means nothing. But also don't just give yourself over to what you feel and let it just jerk you around in life. No, you pray what you feel. You let God help you sort it out. And at this point, we need to, again, just get another strong footing. Uh, we need to remember that first grip that we took with who it is that we're praying to. Our Father in heaven. Because who it is that we're praying to makes all of the difference. A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So if you're praying to God like it's an episode of Shark Tank and God is that crotchety old bald man who just is like nitpicking everything and doesn't like anything in life, right, except what benefits him, you show up into the throne room and you're presenting this great presentation of why God should endorse what you're doing and get some backing for it, if that's how you show up to, the, to, to pray, show up to communicate with God, you will just avoid that altogether. You'll never show up to do business with that guy. When I come home after work, I open up the door and say hello, and I hear this screeching cry, of, Daddy! Daddy! And then all of a sudden I hear this little scuffle of princess dresses just coming down the hallway. Now, I, I don't, I'm not claiming to be the world's best dad. I cannot in good conscience drink out of that coffee mug in the morning. Best dad ever. I don't know if any dad in good conscience is saying like, I'm killing it. Again, if you are, come pray for me. I want that. But my girls come running through the house to find me when I get home because they know I'm their father and I have good intentions for them. I love, I love to get down on my daughter's level. I love to play and to wrestle and to laugh and giggle and I'll even do dress up with them. I'll be daddy princess. I don't even know what that means. I don't know if this is going to screw you up. I don't care. I'll get on your level <laughs> and I'll do this. Because I'm for you, and I like you. I like the weird things that you're saying right now. And maybe, maybe you're struggling to pray 
to communicate with God because you've never heard this before about God. Or maybe you have believed it, but life's circumstances have cast a shadow of doubt or forgetfulness over this, but I want you to hear loud and clear this morning. Hear again with fresh ears. God is your Father, and He has good intentions for you. You are not a performer. You are a predestined child of God. And that simply means that God picked you. Before you did anything right, before you said anything right, before you could dress yourself, before you understood anything, God said, I am adopting you as my son. I am adopting you as my daughter. He's our father, and he has good intentions for us this morning. I want this to usher us into practicing overperforming. I want this to usher us into this new era I believe is coming for us in our prayer life. Where we don't perform and we don't talk to some kind of big vending machine up in the sky that we're hoping will drop some kind of blessing for us if we put enough like kind of great coins in there. No, there's, there's an era that's coming for this church, for this family, for you. It includes you. Where prayer no longer becomes some kind of just clunky, uncomfortable, unsuccessful thing. No, it's going to be... It's going to be a delight for us, even in the struggle, even in the confusion. That's not going to go away. But there's going to be a little sprout of delight that comes up in this season for you in praying. I believe it. Prophesy to that. Delight will return to your prayer life. If you commit to practice and not perform, take them up on this liberation offer this morning. Come out of that. Come out of that. I want to quickly just give some what I think are practical kind of tips as we move into practicing over performing. And then I'd like to just pray. I'd like to make some space just to pray this morning. One, Get a space and a place. So if you don't actually schedule this thing out, good luck on letting this thing just kind of find its way into your schedule. You find a space in your day, morning, lunch, evening, late night. If you're not a morning person, dear God, don't try to be a morning person. When do you come alive? When are you at your best? Give that to the Lord. Just mark it off. This is the time that I engage because I'm most awake, most alive, most happy to be alive. Find a place in your life, bedroom, backyard, shower. Just night that place. This is the place that I pray. This is the space in which I pray. Put it on the calendar. Two, get over comparison and get around those who inspire you. So if you're going to start working out, right, I decided this year I'm going to start getting a little more physically active. You know who I don't want to hang around in the beginning is Noel Peepgrass because he's a fine physical specimen and he knows what he's doing and I have no idea. But once I get over myself, guess who I want to be around? Noel Peepgrass because he knows what he's doing. Who is it that you've witnessed in life, you've been in a prayer circle with and you thought, whoa, that person is talking with God. They're not monologuing. It feels like something's alive in there. You find that person, and you ask to pray with them. That person was Eric Riley for me. I was in a room, big, booming voice with a truckload of faith comes screaming through, and I thought, whoa, I want whatever is coming out of that guy. And so I'd literally just kind of find my way and just weasel into the prayer circle next to Eric because I wanted it. That's what I wanted. Do that. Find them. Ask them. Just get over it. Go for it. Three, don't fight it, follow it. How many of you classically 
in your prayer time. You start to pray for one thing, and then all of a sudden, you are thinking about something wild and out there and nowhere close to where you started. I'll start praying for my daughter, and then all of a sudden, I'm thinking about where you can get deep-fried Twinkies <laughs> at this time of year. It's very serious and fervor. Like, it's just, what is this? Anybody else have these rabbit trail moments? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German theologian, he, he has this underground school during the Nazi reign, and, and some of his students come to him, and they, they say, hey, we're having a tough time, because part of um, the training was two hours of prayer a day. And they came and said, hey, we're having a tough time staying focused for two hours. And he said, follow that, and whoever or whatever it lands on, you turn that person or that thing into a prayer. Maybe the Holy Spirit is interrupting our ritual of praying what we ought to pray, and he's trying to actually get us to what we're really meditating and obsessing on. And we get there, and instead of just swatting our hands and saying, get back to praying for the orphans, you pray for that person. You pray for that thing that you've been obsessing on. You turn that over to God, and then you can move back into that whatever you were praying for before. Lastly, it's not always going to feel awesome, and that's okay. John Tyson says addiction to religious ecstasy is often idolatry. Some of us need to stop chasing the mount of transfiguration because God wants to lead us into the Garden of Gethsemane. We're looking for this amazing, like, face-altering moment with God, and that doesn't happen. Obviously, we didn't meet with God. But maybe he's trying to get you into a deeply intense emotional place to deal with something, to come alongside of you, to help disciple you in that place. Would you stand this morning? We're going to um, come to the table I'm just going to receive, if you're a believer, the bread and the juice. I just, I think Travis is going to lead us to the table, but I, I just want to share this last thought. I was thinking about Jesus, and I was thinking what it would be like to be in a prayer circle with Jesus. I mean, we get to see kind of his prayer life, and we get his, like, teaching on how to pray. But what was it like being there? hearing his voice. Was he emotive? Was he stoic? Did he have like, you know, did he, what, what was it like? And the scripture actually tells us in Hebrews 5, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission Jesus was not stoic. Jesus is not stoic. Did you know that he's, he's praying right now for us? And I bet his fervor has only increased. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time.